Hello, everybody. I'll be like uh, Sandy. I can't see everybody out there. She's not even here to make fun of her. Okay. Mike Morgan. Stand up a second. This dude, right, yeah, give him a hand. We, we do that in the American church so you, for no reason. I just wanted to just say, hey, look, there's Mike Morgan. Thank you. You can sit down. No, I'm joking. No, look at this uh, bass guitar over here. Look at this bad boy. Mike has created this whole thing all by his little lonesome. Isn't that awesome? Mike, come up here a second. I don't know, which, which microphone can he use? Can he use a special one? The gold one? Anyone? How about the, this one? Can you use that one? All right, Mike's going to preach my sermon today. <laughs> Surprise. A minute and a half left, right? <laughs> Dag <Dagnabbit>. it. <laughs> well, tell me about that guitar, just for a minute. Uh, okay, well, uh, it's a, something I've just had in my heart to start doing. Uh, it's a, kind of a new hobby for me, but um, basically created everything from, from the ground up except for the neck. Was it hard? Um, it's, there, there's some challenges in there. What was the hardest thing about that? Uh, probably uh, you know, doing a lot of the routing work, getting things mm-hmm. you know, just correct and everything lined up correctly. And everything. Now, when you, when you first started that, did it seem rather difficult at first? You were like, I don't know how I'm going to do that. <laughs> yeah, it seemed like a big task. I didn't know if I was going to be able to do it. But the more that you started having success, the more that you realized you could do it, right? Yeah. And were you surprised at how beautiful it is? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we are too. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. That was awesome. But uh, Mike, Mike is one of the most creative people I know, and uh, although he probably wouldn't say that, but he is a very creative person. And uh, I don't know. I was thinking, uh, well, I was thinking about sharing this. I was thinking about all the different things that Mike and I have done together. And um, I don't know if you guys remember, he was flying on a zip line with Tracy. You remember that? <laughs> that was pretty insane. And uh, but he he's always come up with some crazy stuff. And the first time that I ever met Mike, I danced with him. No lie. I had never met Mike before. I don't think we did we meet before. Uh, yeah, we were. Uh, and uh, Pastor Scott knew that I did a little bit of theater stuff, and it was like I was fairly uh, new to the church, and, and I had not met Mike. I knew his brother, and uh, his brother was putting together a VBS, wasn't it? And uh, they did a little human video, and they just said, well, just do this, this, and this. And so we were like, all right. And so it was such a long human video, and we were just sitting there like the whole time because, you know, it's like, okay. What's gonna... And so on the way out, Mike and I just kind of walked out of the room, and we just started dancing together out the room for some reason. It just kind of seemed natural. I don't know. Those things just happened with me. I don't know. They just, right, Chip? Where's Chip at? Chip was afraid I was going to dance with him this morning, but that will not happen. Um, I have other plans today. <laughs> so, but that also jogged my other parts of my memory, which are very short. But uh, Pam and I have been in ministry for 20 years this past June, and uh, full-time ministry. And uh, when we left uh, Springfield, Missouri, we thought this was a pit stop along the way, and uh, we were going to go to Regent University, and I was going to get my master's degree in communication. And uh, anyways, uh, we happened to stop, make a little pit stop here at another church, and uh, they had us be the youth ministers there. And not to go into too much history, but as I think I shared that one other time, but uh, I don't think that, I think that that church was a vehicle to get us to Cornerstone. God had his plans. And uh, when we came here, I was like, I don't want to go to West Virginia. My dad was a pastor here. He was a pastor in Gent, uh, way back in a little town called Odd. Anybody know where that is? And uh, it was a very little, little bitty town, and uh, he was at a he was a Baptist minister in a in a church called Grandview Baptist Church up there, and and uh, he was there for a long time, and um, and so I was a little kid, and when we left, we went into the city, and I was just like, I, I love the city, you know, because there's always stuff to do, and so when when my brother said, hey, there's a church in West Virginia to go to, I was like, no. <laughs> I'm going to Virginia Beach. There's a beach there, you know, and, and uh, there's no beach in West Virginia. Although some people think that Clater Lake is a beach, but that's not true. But, but uh, right, right, Ed, right? Yeah, it's a beach, it's kind of a beach, has a beach. But anyways, so uh, we are here, and we've been here for 20 years. And, uh, and one of the things that uh, we, when we came to Cornerstone, we were, we were in a place where we were just looking for a place maybe to start a family, and, and we knew it wasn't the other place. 
they didn't really like teenagers. They didn't really like kids. They just wanted them to be the ornamentation around the church. And so we uh, came here, and we felt like we could raise a family here. And thus, the name Cornerstone Family Church. And, and uh, Sky had just started this work and, uh, about three years prior to that. And, and uh, it was just our hearts were meshing together. And it's been quite a ride. And uh, he's enjoyed a lot of my nonsense and let me do a lot of my nonsense. And we've done a lot of great things. So, But anyways... Um, I just wanted to share that. Oh, I was, you just jogged my memory about something about all this history that I learned this week. There's, have you ever noticed that when you talk to like older aunts or, or older people in your family tree, there's things that they bring up that you had no idea and you're sitting there going, wow, that's so cool. No, nobody, nobody. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I'm sitting there with my aunt, which I don't talk to a whole lot. And, uh, I felt connected to the whites this week. I did. We have moonshiners in my family from New York. How awesome is that? They were gangsters, apparently. Something like that. They were the black sheep of the family, and nobody talked about them. So, but we talked about this reunion. So. <laughs> it was my grandfather's grandfather who was supposedly a moonshiner. And uh, anyways, so just thought I'd share that. I wanted you to know that I might be a little bit more connected to you West Virginians than you thought. So... Maybe that's why we enjoy that fire pit so much. Maybe we should connect some other things to that. Okay, never mind. Okay. <laughs> and then I even had another laugh. We were at Applebee's and they had uh, moonshine, uh, what was it, apple, apples, apple pie moonshine or something? I don't know. Okay. I was feeling the whole thing all week, so, you know, <laughs> it was good times. All right, should I, should I read a scripture? I think my two minutes is up. <laughs> good night, everybody. <laughs> All right, I'm so glad it's summer and, and you guys are so relaxed and uh, we can just be ourselves, right? If you can't be yourself in church, th then you probably shouldn't go to church. I mean, this is the only place that you should really be yourself. You should come, you know, undo your tie, right, Mike? How long ago is it that you had a tie on? Oh, yeah, I was talking to the other Mike, but Mike, when was the last time you had a tie on? <laughs> just yesterday. <laughs> Anyways. But this is a place that you should be able to be yourself, and uh, you should be able to look at your neighbor and say, "Ah, hey, you're wearing jeans, cool, look at mine, or uh, hey, yours are tight jeans, you shouldn't be wearing those, you know, <laughs> you know or, or when the, the Oliver comes up here and he plays guitar with a hat on, you should be like, that's cool, man, shading your head from these hot lights up here. You know, we should be all right with that. You know, a lot of times in the church, we have come through so much and uh, a lot of people try to hold on to old myths and, and uh, wives' tales about what's actually in Scripture. How many guys love Scripture? Raise your hand. Because you're in church, you should all raise your hand. Uh, yes, Scripture is a wonderful thing in context. Let me everybody say, in context. Because if I read over here where women should be silent in the church, how many women in here would be excited about that? Ooh, that was just evil looks. No, no. But it's in here. Shouldn't you be, like, excited about that? Or, or that you shouldn't wear jewelry or ornamentation? Or, or men, you shouldn't have tattoos? Or I'm in the wrong church, aren't I? All right. <laughs> or, or how about polyester? You guys in here wearing polyester should not be wearing polyester. Or leisure suits. All right. Uh, or, or uh, how about pork products? Anybody like pork products in here? Man, oh man. There's, there's, there's going to be a hole that's going to open up underneath this church, and you guys are just going to fall. Eat more beef, right? All right. No, we've come a long way in the church, and uh, there are a lot of legalistic things that, that people try to hold on to, and context is everything. Context is what you need to understand when you study Scripture. When you study Scripture, you can't just pull a part of Scripture out and just say, well, isn't that awesome, and just make a whole doctrinal belief out of it. Like snake handling. Why shouldn't we handle snakes? I mean, it's in the Bible that if we touch snakes and scorpions, they're not going to harm us, right? I mean, we got them back there on the wall. <laughs> right? I mean, you know... Right. Context is everything, and uh, in your in your Christian walk, is that not true? That when someone takes something that you say and take it way out of context, you're sitting there going, "That's not what I meant at all." 
How many guys have ever been quoted in, in, in the newspaper? And it wasn't anything that you really said. Uh, it, was, it was everything around it that made what you said completely different. And that's what we do a lot of times in the church. I remember one time that uh, the news media came out, and we did our first fundraiser, I think, for the teen center. And, and, uh, and they were asking me some questions. And, and she said that I was complaining about my volunteers. And I'm like, I don't ever remember complaining about the volunteers. I was like, I was like I'll never talk to the media again. But... Of course, Pastor Scott knows that really well, doesn't he? I'll take things out of context. I want to read a scripture to you. Would that be good? This is not that scripture. All right, uh, this is the scripture uh, in Philippians. I want to read this to you real quick. Can I do that for you? Can we throw that up on the screen? Yeah, Philippians. There we go. A lot of you guys, I'll read it from there. Uh, a lot of you guys have read this a lot of times, uh, and we're going to read it again. This is in part of a greeting that uh, Paul was giving to the Philippians. And he says, being confident in this, he was talking about how awesome of a people they were and how they were co-laborers with them, and he was just really praising them. He says, being confident in his praise towards them, that he who has begun a good work in you will carry it out to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That is very awesome. That is so cool that we need to be confident that the things that God is doing in us, he is going to see it to completion. And some things, it's a longer journey than others. There's some people that, that they, are, uh, they seem to get things, they click, it clicks like this, but then there's other people, they have to go through some things because of the path that they have been on or maybe the people that they have been around to completely change from going this direction to this direction. It's called working out our salvation. It's called working out uh, our, our path or our journey unto salvation. And our salvation has already been granted us. It's free. It's a free gift. And it's one of the things that God has granted us freedom in, is if you accept Christ, you will go to heaven. You will collect $200, and you'll be able to go right on through, right? That's, that's God. He, he, if you accept Christ, He gives it freely. We just celebrated freedom, and uh, we just celebrated a awesome thing that has happened in our world history, and that is the freedom of tyranny. And our country gave a lot. The people of this country gave a lot. And Pam was right. It was women and it was men in the early days that gave their lives, and, and they did so many different heroic things to make this country free. And the cool thing about this country is, is that we're constantly morphing into a better society, into a better people. And, and you know, regardless of what, where you're politically at, I do believe that God is at the head of this thing, and I do believe he's at the helm, and he is steering this ship. And I think that we look at history, and we can see how clearly God has guided our steps in this nation. Now, does that mean that we have done godly things? No, it does not. But it does mean that God is in control of the overall history of what goes on. We do have free will, and in spite of our free will, God still steers it in the direction that it needs to go. Isn't that awesome? You're so quiet. Maybe you need to move up a little closer. I don't know. Well, anyways, um, maybe like a lot of you, we celebrated with fireworks. Isn't that exciting? Did you guys celebrate with fireworks? This, didn't you like the shoot em up ones in the sky? Yeah, yeah. You know, Bridget Smith enjoyed our fireworks, too, on Thursday night. She enjoyed our fireworks. Her and uh, Melissa Griffith, they enjoyed our fireworks, didn't you? She talked about it on Facebook. <laughs> she said, who in the world is shooting fireworks at this late at night? <laughs> i got to get up at 5 a.m. So we were celebrating the 50th anniversary of my parents. I just want you to know that. <laughs> All right. Well, anyways, church, we need to get to this place where we are going from this, this land of legalism or this land of taking the Scripture out of context and living life in context of the Word of God. And part of the Word of God is understanding that we are free from legalism, but yet we are held captivity to conviction. Did you know that? That, that our, 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 our focus in our faith is the freedom in Christ. And the freedom in Christ is to be close to God enough to hear His voice in our heart and in our ear when we read Scripture, when we're talking to one another, when we are praying, when we're uh, in the marketplace. We, are, we need to be in partnership with God at all times so that we are in conviction of the Holy Spirit in our life. 
He is our partner in this thing. He is the person who brings freedom into our life. You know, a lot of times we don't realize how free we are until we walk back into some place that is full of legalism. Have you ever been to another place that's full of legalism? No. Okay. My sons all the time, they're, 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 they laugh a little, little bit when they go home to uh, Pennsylvania or they go to a different church, something like that, and they're like, oh my goodness. <laughs> they walk into another church and they say, it's just, it's not free there. I can't be myself. And um, we don't really understand a lot of times how much freedom that we have in Christ until we walk back into our past or we walk back where we have come from and we see how God along the way has just freed us from so many different things in our life. And, uh, you know, sometimes certain people hold you captive. Certain people hold you into a place where you can not experience the freedom in Christ because they hold you to what you were 20, 30, 40 years ago. And when they hold you into those places, it's very hard to be free. Am I right? Whether it be parents, whether it be siblings, whether it be uncles or aunts, or whether it be... um, you know, maybe a pastor or maybe, uh, you know, a friend, uh, maybe it's a, a past lifestyle. They'll hold you captive because they want you a certain way when you have grown to be something completely different. And uh, how many guys know that eagles were born to fly? They were born to soar. They were born to be something significant, born to be something amazing. When you look at an eagle, you don't go there and go, wow, look at that duck. You know, <laughs> No, you go, that is awesome. You see a duck flying next to it, probably get eaten, but you see that duck, and you're just like, look at that, look at that eagle right there. And I was so amazed when they uh, had all those dead fish last year, and uh, there, was, there was all these vultures just kind of like hovering around, kind of like that old Disney movie, you know, the Dumbo with those vultures, and they're just kind of pecking at things. That eagle just soars right in there and goes, whoosh, <laughs> and picks up some dead fish, you know, and and uh, it was so much more majestic than what those vultures were doing. They were just sitting there going, wah, 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 and the eagle just goes, <laughs> picks up that big fish. And it's like all disgusting, you know, but it, we'll hold that story for another time. But I'm telling you that you need to get rid of legalism in your life. And you know, uh, we have, I was having this discussion with Tracy yesterday. I was saying, uh, we were just talking about, Um, grace and how messy grace is. And a lot of times people are so afraid of even talking about grace in church because if we let loose the beast of grace, the problem is people will live in such grace in their life that they will forget about God and who he is and his goodness and things because they'll feel like they can do just whatever they want to do. Well, there is a hitch to that because freedom isn't free, right, Ed? It's not free. Freedom is enjoyed, and we can be free within those boundaries. But even in Christ, He ties us to conviction in our life. And I would dare say that if you are not living under conviction in your life, are you really following after Christ? Is I can tell when people are really following after Christ because things are changing around them. When they, when they walk out the door, they're, they're in partnership with Christ. When they go talk to people, they want to see how God wants to speak through them into those people's lives. When people are in Christ, you can see that their environments are changing. You, you go into an office, you instantly know when someone is a Christian and when someone is not because it just comes out. It's natural outflow of your life. Do you remember the old rain barrels? The old rain barrels when the water would fill them up and they would just overflow? You know, before you could just hit that barrel and the water would not flow out. But when there's a massive rainstorm, that just flows up and over. And you gently push that thing and the water just flows out. That's the way our life is. If you are walking in the conviction of Christ, if you're walking in his conviction, you're staying close to him when someone bumps you. Not hateful anger and and bitterness comes out. It's just an outflow of his spirit because he has been dwelling within you, and so therefore he comes out. It's easy to react like the world reacts. When you get punched in the face, you want to punch him back. And believe you me, I I, I like vigilante. If I I was a superhero, man, it would fulfill my life. It wouldn't fulfill your life seeing me in in a Speedo, but it would fulfill my life. I mean, we see so many abused kids in different situations that I'm just like, oh, I want to go take revenge or teach somebody a lesson. But that's not our way. Our way is the way of conviction, the way of love, the way of Christ. When someone agitates us, what comes out is the love of Christ. 
What is in the love of Christ? The love of Christ is forgiveness, and it's, it's love, and it's mercy, and it's all these things. But there's also, as the mature Christian, there's conviction for me. Now, it doesn't mean, you see, the, the problem is, is that we are so used to convicting other people that we don't let conviction convict us. Because if we let conviction convict us, love would come out. And even though that my brother or my sister might be in sin or, or far away from God, that love compels me to bring them back in and to bring them into restoration. Not necessarily sit there and condemn them of their sins. Guess what? Sinners know that they sin. Sinners know that they're in sin. Sinners know that they are far away from God. Their heart is longing for a better land, a better place. And that is you. That's what they're longing for, is restoration in their life. I want to read this little scripture to you guys. And before I read that, I want to just set it up for you. You know, um, when we live outside of Christ, it doesn't mean that I'm not saying we're not saved. I'm saying that we are Christians who are not living closely with Christ. We're not listening to his thoughts and his heart. We're not spending time in the word. We're not spending time with his people. We're, we're just kind of hanging out, but we're not really following after Christ. Our life becomes kind of distant and despondent. It's far away, and we become aggravated and, and agitated, and we start wallowing back around in the things that God set us free from. And I'm going to read the scripture to you. This is in Galatians, and, and, um, and Paul is just talking to these Galatians and just saying, be free, please be free. And he's talking to them about uh, what develops in their life when they, when they start walking away from God, even though they are still uh, called Christians. They start wandering around in this weird realm. And um, I also have a little illustration I want to uh, put up on the screens while I read this, so I hope that you can get that. Could you pull that up for me? Make sure that volume's down because, all right, this right here is a dung beetle. I want you to watch this dung beetle as I read this scripture. Are you ready? This is a first for Cornerstone. It is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your way all the time. Repetitive loneliness, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. Frenzy by joyless grabs for happiness, trinketed gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition. I know some people like that. They, they just can't get enough of competition. All-consuming, never-satisfied wants. A brutal temper. Anybody know anybody like that? An impotence to love or to be loved. Did you hear that? That is powerful if you hear that. Divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, a vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival. We see that in our nation right now. Of rage, of, of selfish ambition, dissensions and fractions, and envy. A lot of times we would read this in context of the sinner, but this is really talking to the Christian. Drunkenness and orgies. Okay, nobody wants to raise their hands. Uh, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, he's not talking about you're going to go to hell and the third level of hell. He's not talking about that. What he's talking about is you will not inherit the abundant life. You will not inherit what it means to live in this world in the kingdom. You liking that dung beetle yet? Makes sense now, doesn't it? That dung beetle right there, he spends his whole life finding someone else's crap. He makes it into a ball, and he rolls it around. And he rolls it around until it's perfectly round. He rolls it into the best location possible, plants it into the ground, and it's actually a mama, and the mama puts her eggs in it. And that baby, what that baby does is eats the dung becomes an adult, finds someone else's crap, rolls around in it, and rolls it around, and rolls it around, and buries it, and puts their eggs in it for the next generation. <laughs> yeah, they are very excited about that dung. Look at that. <laughs> this beetle is excited, man. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? It's exciting. 
Did that, did that scripture make more sense to you now? That was Galatians uh, 5, by the way, 526. Um, doesn't that scripture hit that right on the head right there? A lot of times people, they just roll around that stuff all the time. Uh, they, they, they seem like they get over it, and then they go around that mountain again, and they come back. And then they roll around in that dung all over again, and again, and again, and again. And they're Christians. They come to church all the time. And because of that, they become very judgmental people. And, and they don't really understand that their life could be so much more. And so what they end up doing is they infect other people to become just like them. Because if everybody's like them, guess what? They don't feel so bad. But there is a greater way. There is a higher way. Why did you come to Christ in the first place? The reason why you came to Christ in the first place, because there was a, a longing in your heart for a, a better place, a better road. The, the, the uh, scripture says you're looking for a better land. Our founding fathers were looking for a better land because they were persecuted and they were uh, dominated by someone else and they wanted freedom in their heart. Our life should desire freedom in our life all the time. But it requires something of us. It means that we have to let go of the dung. We have to, to, to not live that way anymore because our children and our children's children and our children's children are living this way. And we need to have an understanding that we need to get away from those people and those influences in our life that are constantly re-encouraging us to live that way. You're better than that. Let me read this little scripture that follows this one I just read to you. This is Galatians 5.24. It says, legalism is helpless in bringing this about. And I was just talking about context, 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 context. Because when people over the years have said, you know, you, you, shouldn't, you should dress up to go to church because you give your best to God. They didn't realize that they were putting legalism on you. They didn't realize that when you said, don't wear a hat in church, that they were putting legalism on you. It's a form of legalism. We always think that legalism is holiness, and holiness therefore means our best. Well, it's not the outside that matters. God looks at the context of the heart. And when he looks at you, he doesn't look at what you have done for him. He looks at where your heart is. That's why a lot of churches, when they have steeples that were dedicated by granddaddy's granddaddy's granddaddy, God doesn't care about that. You care about that. It's your memory. It's your memorial. But it's not your memorial to God. It's your memorial to that dead relative. God bless them. God bless them for giving. But when they gave that money, guess what happened? It went into God's till. It was no longer theirs. God could do with it whatever he wanted to. That's just the fact of the matter. You know, um, a lot of times we tie ourselves into certain ways of thinking. It's our belief system. And the thing that will drag you into a form of hell on this earth is your belief system, is the way that you think about things, the way that you think about other things. There's some of you in here that have been holding on to just bitterness and unforgiveness for such a long time because you want to treat that person to what it feels like and how you feel inside. That probably that person has no clue how you feel, has no clue or understanding how you feel. You know, you might have suffered abuse. You might have suffered uh, at the hands of some pretty nasty, gnarly stuff in your life. And you are left, you are left like that dung beetle, just carrying that sucker around everywhere you go. God has a higher, a better way for you. Let me read this to you. This is in uh, verse 26. It says, since this is the kind of life that we have chosen. He's talking about life through the Spirit, becoming responsive and crucified with Christ. He says, since this is a life that we have chosen, the life of the Spirit, let us make sure that we do not hold it to an idea in our heads or just a sentiment in our heart, but the works, it works its way out in the implications of every detail of our life. That means do not compare yourselves to others as if one of us is better than the other. That's really interesting, isn't it? And I like this in verse uh, 6, it says, or uh, chapter 6, in the very be beginning, it says, Live creatively, my friends. I love the message, because the message says some things a little bit differently, but it means the same thing. But he says in, in uh, chapter 6 of Galatians, he says, live creatively. I've been reading this book, and one of the things that uh, this book has been saying is the creative nature of God is so important in our life. It brings about hope and change inside of us. 
And the thing that creativity brings is wisdom. But did you know that wisdom also begets creativity? I, I was, I, I, that was really speaking to me, that, that God desires his people to be so interconnected with wisdom that creativity comes out, and so interconnected with creativity that wisdom comes out. Our society needs us. And only you, the body of Christ, can bring the answer to our world. I'm so glad that Pam talked about what's happening in our country right now. Only you, church, only you have the answer. We have smart people in Washington, don't we? And they have been doing so many smart things in our country. They are so wise. They look at you and they say, look how dumb you are, we're so wise. Look at our country right now. I guarantee you, and I, I challenge you to understand that it is the body of Christ that has the answer. You know, uh, we, we get a lot of blame for a lot of things, but the fact of the matter is, uh, if you were, and Clinton was telling me this, if you go up to uh, where the floods happen, there is more ministries up there than there is secular organizations. And I think Clinton was telling me that, uh, that there is one secular organization, it's, it's a bunch of military guys up there. <laughs> there is more people that do ministry in our country that change this country. There's more people that do ministry in this world that change the world than we are ever given credit for. A lot of times there's that one person that has one, done one thing wrong or done a lot of things wrong, and because they're in the spotlight, all Christians are labeled as that. I want you to know that you are good people. If you're a Christian, raise your hand. You're a good person. Did you know that? Yeah. And you have this creative ability inside of you to pull from the presence of God into this realm and bring some things that this realm needs. You know what this realm needs? Yeah, so much of Jesus. That's what we need. But through Jesus in our life, creativity and wisdom to this world. I, I've looked at this scripture over and over again. Over the, I cannot think of a better time for this thing to rise up inside of its people. We can't be storm chasers. You know, there's, there's awesome things that are happening all over the country with what God is doing. And I love it. And I listen to it. And I, I, it, it it's just energizes me. And I always say, why not here? Why not here? Why not here? We are good people. We're good Christian people. Why not here? And it comes out of this, this, this realm of staying close to God and being close to Him. Not out of legalism, not out of, oh, you need to do these three things. It's about staying close to God. And when you are agitated and when you are bothered, you don't react like the world. You don't just go bananas. I don't know how many times I have said that word in regards to some people in the last two, three years of life. They just went bananas. I don't know what happened. They just went bananas. That, that's, that shouldn't be us. When people look at us, they should be full of love. My father, I'll end with this note, my father is a man who has uh, been challenged a whole lot in his life, as many of you have. He's a great man, and he has taught me so much mercy in my life. And, and, he's, and, and he, would, he was a, a Baptist minister for a while. And, um, and he had this heart that he wanted to see people in church. He wanted to see people because he knew that this was where the answer was. And so he would, he would literally go out after Sunday and just walk the streets and talk to people. And he would talk to prostitutes. And he would talk to, this is back in the 70s, he would talk to hippies. And so how many hippies out here? He might have talked to you. Yeah. He might have talked to you, Mike White and Tammy White. Uh, but he would go out there and he'd pull them into the church. And, and they did not look like any of the other people in that church. And uh, there's, I remember this one dude, his name was Peanut. And he's not, not Peanut, but <laughs> he was an old dude with long hair. Um, but he came in and he sat on the pew for a long time. And and uh, we went on bus trips with him, and we did all kinds of ministry and, and all this stuff. And my father, at, at one point, got kicked out of that church because those people did not look like him, because they did not love him. And there was another church where, where, uh, where my dad was ministering in where those people did not want to grow anymore. And it was time and time again like that where my father started seeing success, not because he was a great man, just because he loved. My dad was a great man of love. And... Uh, and he would do things to change churches, and they weren't ready for it. Church, we are ready for it. You are ready for it, and you are ready to do great things. Not because you are not struggling, not because you are perfect, not because you don't sin, but because you are ready, because when God looks at you, he looks at you as perfect, and he looks at you as, as a vessel that he can use, as beautiful. 
And we got to stop with this mess that I was reading before, where, where things are just rattling us all the time, and all these people are just coming into our life and influencing us. You know, you might have bad kids. Well, you know what? Your bad kids shouldn't ruin your relationship with God. It's completely different. I'm not talking about you, Braylon. I want to pray for you guys. Why don't you stand up? Let's pray together. I'm feeling some love here today. Isaac, I just want you to know that I was completely surprised myself. <laughs> when Pam says you were black, I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, what's going on? <laughs> Nobody told me this? <laughs> How long has this happened? <laughs> Can we just be? Can we just be a people? I think we can just be a people and not worry about that mess. I love each and every one of you, and you are all distinct in God's eyes. When He looks at you, He does look at us all as the body of Christ, but He loves you individually. He loves all over you. And, uh, and, and it's our little differences a lot of times that can be either the greatest thing on the planet Earth or can be the worst thing on the planet of Earth. And uh, the body of Christ is the only organization, only institution that God has ordained to make this work, make it work. We can't divide ourselves. We have to unite ourselves. All right? Remember, I'm sorry, I'm just way past the two minutes, sorry. But uh, do you remember several years ago when Pastor Scott preached the shark sermon? Remember that? Jabber jaws, remember that? No, I'm going to have to refresh you. Sit down. No, I'm joking. <laughs> There were, we were talking, uh, I think he was talking about gossip or something like that, and just how gossip has a lot of times, it's like a shark, a shark attack, you know? And uh, it's a jabber jaws. Remember jabber jaws from the 80s, <laughs> that little cartoon? And uh, a lot of times we bite each other with our words. And, and he's, he was saying that at the end of the sermon, what we should do is we should shout out real loud, shark. There's a shark in the water. And I think that, that we as the body of Christ, we need to keep each other accountable to those things and to those words. And, and whether it be me or whether it be you, we need to keep each other accountable because, you know what, that person next to you is worth loving. That person next to you is worth so much that, you know what, it bothers the father when you pick on his kids. Whether it's your husband, ooh, ouch. Whether it's your wife, ouch. Whether it's your kids, whether it's your friend, we gotta stop devouring one another. We gotta start loving each other, start caring about one another. And I'm not saying that you don't. Some of you guys really love each other. I mean, some of you guys really loved me over the holidays, as you can see. A lot of a lot of good food there. Let's love each other. Why don't you grab the hand of the person next to you? <laughs> Isaac's all alone. Someone grab Isaac's hand so he doesn't feel so bad. All right. Why don't we cross aisles? That's symbolic, isn't it? Yeah, let's cross aisles. You can do that. We'll say the Democrats are over here and the Republicans are over here. Come on, get together. Get together. Let's hold hands. Independents are over there. No, I'm joking. All right, let's pray. Father, you are greater than us. Anything that goes on in this country, anything that goes on in our personal lives. And so many times we roll it around like dung and we just keep it around because we have something to prove and we have something to say and we, we, we want our thing to be known and because we're just, we just want people to know that we are something special. Well, God, I think that in the body of Christ, we need to be that th something special. We need to be more than just what the world does. And God, there's so many loving people in here. And sometimes they don't get enough credit. They don't get enough credit of how much they love. They love people, and people just take advantage of them and take advantage of their little world and, and, and everything that they do. And, and they, don't, they don't feel appreciated. And, and maybe on the other end of it, some people just feel like that nobody loves them and Father, I just pray for all those people who feel like losers today, who feel like just despondent, feel like they're unforgiven, or they need to forgive, and they just feel crushed in their spirit. You are a God of forgiving. You are a God of love. You are a God of mercy. And I just ask that you would just wash upon them right now. Just wash upon them. Let them know that they are bigger than what they think that they are. Lift their heads up high, that they can see you and your glory and who you are. And today, God, I just ask, Lord, that you would just let them see you for who you see them as, and that is the righteousness of Christ, that they are higher, and that they need to live by conviction, because in conviction there is realness, there is a wholeness here. When we live by our own means, all this other junk begins to happen to us, and we start thinking differently. 
And God, when we look at each other, let us look at each other with love. Let's look at each other with grace. Let's look at each other with non-judgmental in the sense of not holding, not in the sense of holding each other accountable, but not maligning and destroying one another. Let us be those people, God, that hold up a standard in this country and in this world that says what we have is worth fighting for, and what we have is worth putting out into the world and showing the world and demonstrating to the world that we are the righteousness, the goodness, the, the awesomeness, the reputation of God. So grateful, God. In your name, man. I'll smack your neighbor. Say, I'm sorry you're so different from me. <laughs> I still love you. <laughs> love you guys. And I, I, I also want to thank you for embracing me as a Yankabilly all these years. So God bless you all.